Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum. Uh, my name is Amber Stowell, and I'm a Coastal Outreach Specialist for Pennsylvania Sea Grant. I'm excited to bring you this forum in partnership with Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection today. We're changing things up a little bit so we can showcase some amazing work happening across Pennsylvania through formal and informal education, as well as several robust uh, volunteer programs. Through education and volunteerism, Pennsylvanians throughout the Commonwealth are working towards clean water and healthier environments. We have audience members from far and wide today, so I encourage you to type into the chat what city or state you're tuning in from while I go over a few logistics. Most of us are pretty familiar for, with Zoom by now, but it doesn't help to go over uh, just a couple details. If you do have questions for the presenters, please put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. The chat is functional, but your questions might be missed if a lot of people are typing in there. So we definitely want you to use that Q&A box for questions for the presenters. If we don't get to your question today, we will pass them along to the appropriate presenter and share those, res those responses with you. And presenters, you are more than welcome to reply to the Q&A questions directly if you feel um, uh, that it is appropriate for you to do so. Just a fair uh, warning, this meeting is being recorded. The recording and the notes will be available on Pennsylvania Sea Grant's website within the next few weeks. And just another note, Act 48 credits might be available through your school district for attending this forum. If you are hoping to apply for those credits through your district and you're interested in receiving a certificate of completion, you'll get a survey at the end of this uh, webinar, um, most likely via your email. And if you fill out that survey, we'll be able to provide you with that certificate of completion. And with that, I will turn it over to my co-host, Tim Bruno from the uh, DEP. Thank you, Amber, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the February 2023 meeting of the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Environmental Forum. My name is Tim Bruno, and I work on Great Lakes issues for the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection. For those of you that are new to the Pennsylvania LEAF, this forum hosts informational sessions that allow participants to gain a deeper knowledge and appreciation of the environmental issues that affect our Great Lakes. Today's topics of environmental education and volunteerism in Pennsylvania are especially relevant to our communities that continue to face issues such as a change in climate, non-point source pollution to our streams, lakes, and rivers, and continually advancing thoughts on renewable energy generation and sustainable development. Community members must have accurate and up-to-date information on these topics so that they can make educated and informed decisions. But as we all know, the information needed can oftentimes be highly technical and filled with mysterious acronyms. Enter the environmental educator and volunteer. People with a passion for environmental sustainability have a depth of knowledge in these areas. And most importantly, the ability to translate these topics into easily understood concepts for an audience that can span as young as preschooler to those preschoolers' parents to those that are in their post careers and in retirement. Educators and volunteers are the backbone of knowledge transfer from generation to generation, which goes hand in hand with other things that pass from generation to generation, namely our land, our water, our air and our resources. We have a full agenda for today's uh, meeting. So therefore I'm gonna move directly to our presenters. Should you have any questions or conversation on Great Lakes environmental issues after today's meeting, I encourage you to reach out directly to me at tibruno at pa.gov or at 717-798-6001. And now I turn it back over to Amber to introduce our new first speaker for today. Thank you, Tim. It's my great pleasure to introduce Michelle Niedermeyer, the education lead for Pennsylvania Sea Grant. Michelle's going to be talking about what's new with Pennsylvania Sea Grant, environmental literacy, and workforce development. Thanks, Amber. Get this started. Okay. Are you seeing the slides, Amber? Yes, looks good. Excellent. Wonderful. All right. Well, uh, thanks again. Uh, my name is Michelle Niedermeyer, and I'm the education lead 
for uh, Pennsylvania Sea Grant. Uh, this is a newly created position and I've been in it for about a year and a half. Um, I plan, develop, implement, and evaluate education programs with a focus on environmental literacy and workforce development, or ELWID for short, and the stewardship of Pennsylvania's Lake Erie, Susquehanna River, and Delaware River watersheds. And I'm based in our Delaware River uh, office in Philadelphia. Uh, if you're not familiar with Sea Grant, National Sea Grant has four focus areas. Elwood, Environmental Literacy and Workforce Development, is one of them. The other three are healthy coastal ecosystems, resilient communities and economies, and sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. Within Pennsylvania Sea Grant, we have a strategic plan. Um, our most recent strategic plan is 2018 to 2023. And we have two goals within environmental literacy and workforce development. The first is goal one, an environmentally literate public that is informed by lifelong formal and informal opportunities that reflect the range of diversity of the nation's coastal communities. And the second is a diverse and skilled workforce that is engaged and enabled to address critical local, regional, and national needs. We work towards achieving these goals by partnering across the Commonwealth uh, in ways such as via the Pennsylvania Environmental Literacy Steering Committee, which is funded by a NOAA BWET grant. BWET stands for Bay Watershed Education and Training. Um, and even though this is a BWET grant, meaning Chesapeake Bay, it covers the entire Commonwealth. Uh, within the, this grant, um, we have currently uh, been refunded for 2022 to 2024. And um, as you can see, this is a, a graphic of of how we are working across the Commonwealth um, with a steering committee, regional hubs, at-large members and agency representatives along with statewide um, input. Another way that we address these goals is through educator professional development programs. Here are two examples of some recent opportunities where we partnered uh, with various uh, other entities to provide opportunities to both formal and non-formal educators across Pennsylvania. Um, our educational professional development programs frequently use the MIWI framework. MIWI stands for Meaningful Watershed Educational Experience as a way to support student achievement, increase student engagement, and enthusiasm for learning. Um, MIWIs also advance 21st century skills and promote environmental stewardship and civic responsibility. Um, you will learn most, more about MIWIs and also hear from a couple of educators who have participated in our program later in today's forum. So if you would like more information about our formal or non-formal educator programs and to be added to our education email list, you can contact me directly. Um, and I will turn it back over to Amber with that. Thanks. Thank you, Michelle. Does anyone have questions for Michelle? Feel free to type them in the Q&A. And while people are thinking, I'd like to just highlight this comment from um, Asbury Woods. So Sarah Bennett from Asbury Woods says that they have been able to take advantage of these education programs of the, and they've become incredibly valuable. And she thanks you. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions pop up, but if any pop in the Q&A and you wanna answer them, feel free to do that. Um, so we'll move on to our next speaker. Thank you so much. Um, I am happy to introduce Rebecca, Rebecca Shuffle. She is the education facilitator at the Northwest Tri-County Intermediate Unit. So Rebecca, take it away. Thank you so much for having me here today. It is a pleasure to be here and I'm happy to talk to you all about all things environmental literacy with our initiatives in Northwestern Pennsylvania. Can you see my screen? Are you guys seeing that? Yes, looks good. Awesome. And I just got to make sure that I enabled the sound. I feel like I may have skipped again. I'm so sorry. I even practiced this and I got nervous and forgot. Oh, nope, I did it. Okay, we're good. We're back on track. Here we go. So I'm from the IU5, and anyone who's not familiar with what an intermediate unit is, we're kind of a go-between between between the Pennsylvania Department of Education and all of our local districts, whether they're private or public, and I'm here in the Tri-County area um, of Northwest Pennsylvania. Rebecca, we're seeing your desktop, not your slide. Oh, goodness. Oh, all right. I'll, I'm, I'm going to get it this time. I'm so sorry. You got this. <laughs> all right. I think. This should do it. Okay. There you go. That's the one we needed. 
I do have a bit.ly um, for the slides. If anybody's interested, there's lots of links within the slides. So I can share that in the chat. If anyone's interested in taking a look at the slides and the information there within. I'm going to try to get through this quickly because I have way too many things on here, but Okay, so one of the newest initiatives is not just in Northwest Pennsylvania, but statewide, we have the new Pennsylvania STEELS standards, and STEEL stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Environmental Literacy, and Sustainability. So that is a brand new um, initiative statewide that's going on, and there's going to be a focus on local issues. We're going to talk about support for development of environmental literacy plans for all of our local school districts. Those MIWIs that Michelle talked about, we'll be talking about what they are, diving in a little bit deeper, and opportunities for MIWI training and resources for our educators. And finally, I've got some information about IU5 and how anyone who's interested can join our Northwest PA Environmental Literacy Coalition, which is an offshoot of the Pennsylvania Statewide Environmental Literacy Network. So here they are, here's the new STEEL standards. Um, it's all there, science, technology, engineering, environmental literacy, and sustainability. We're looking at implementation by July 1st of 2025. And one of the best things, in my opinion, one of the things I love, especially from an environmental literacy point of view, is that it's very applicable and understandable, relatable to the students because it's focused on local issues. So I think there's going to be a need for the schools to be reaching out to any um, community organizations that have an environmental literacy, any type of environmental focus of what are those local issues going on in the community? Is there any type of local environmental phenomena that the students could really study and investigate and learn more. All of that's going to come to life through the STEEL standards. Uh, there's more information. There's the PDE SAS STEELS Hub. You can really dive deep into those standards, the framework boxes, all that's available there. And there are Act 48 professional development opportunities going on, not only at RIU, but I use across the state and through the state as well. So there's links to those right in the slides. And now I'm going to talk a little bit more about what a MIWI is. So here's a little video that will kind of not only tell you, but also show you all the cool things about MIWIs. It's 79. Good luck. Got it? He's so cool. Is it steep or flat? If you see a non-native invasive, point your finger in that direction. Oh my god, this is not a... But between zero and four. What do you think? Four or five? As a scientist, the way you find out is you conduct an experiment. I wanted to learn more about plants, especially from like this side of the world. In a classroom, we don't get the hands-on experience versus here. Like we actually get to see the plants. We actually get to like identify. Like identify. Ah, she said it, Taylor. But the volume of water is going to be very high. Like anywhere that you see compost, like on top of this hill here, down in this little valley. You're welcome. A lot of that pollution that's coming in is coming from all throughout the watershed. So for anyone unfamiliar with a MIWI, that video helps illustrate and really bring to life all the concepts. It looks like there are quite a few people um, in on the call today on the forum that have some experience with MIWI. So I'm sure you could probably share more and have wonderful expertise to share. But as Michelle had mentioned, all of this came about because of the NOAA Chesapeake Bay Watershed Agreement. And we're really all focused on the goal of enabling our students to graduate with knowledge and skills to act responsibly and protect and restore their local watershed, whether it's Chesapeake Bay Watershed or up here by the Great Lakes like we are. And here we just have a map that illustrates those watersheds and all the different waterways within our area, within the state. 
So when we're talking about a MIWI, there are four essential elements. We have our issue definition, We've got an outdoor field experience, and you could see lots of those in the video. Kids out there getting their feet wet. And then synthesis and conclusion, we're really diving into the data that the students are gathering. And then finally, the culmination is the stewardship and civic action project. And that's really where the sustainability takes place. So for the issue definition, a lot of student voice and choice ties in here. Students focus on an issue or a problem a phenomena ties into those steel standards and they need to do some research, they need to investigate. The outdoor field experience is them getting out there and as you can see, getting their feet wet, maybe even more than their feet and collecting data, making observations and getting ready to answer some questions. And we at the IU have some really great tools, um, stream study kits that can help with this part of the MIWI. I'll talk a little bit about that in just a bit. Synthesis and conclusion, making sense of all that data they collect. And finally, their stewardship project. So we've got some supporting practices here. The classroom teacher is really going to be active throughout the entire MIWI. We're going to be integrating the MIWI right into the class, pardon me, the classroom curriculum. We've got a local contest, context for place-based education and our sustained activity. There's some links to some really great resources here. This is a MIWI guide that has all the details, all the essential elements, and there's information on training. There's a MIWI planning checklist that'll help guide any classroom teacher through the process. And this doesn't only have to be done by schools and classrooms. Um, there's ways that this could be bonafide. So scouting groups or other types of community groups could do a MIWI if this is something that you're interested in. And like I said, um, our IU, IU5, as well as other IUs throughout the state have these MIWI field kits, stream study kits. Uh, we are in the process of putting our stream study kits into our lending library so that they can be checked out and used by local school districts um, for your MIWI, to support your MIWI. All kinds of great things to make all of that data collection easier. So here's one if you're testing soil. There was a, a gal in the video doing a soil testing study with one of those tools. Thermometers, all different kinds of things to test weather, climate, lots of great tools. Can get lots of great data from those. Chemical test. And lots and lots of good stuff for the biological test. There is a MIWI online course, MIWI 101. Um, it's linked out here if you're interested in taking that course. There is, um, I believe Act 48 is provided through the Chesapeake Bay Organization for that course. You'll get a certificate of completion. And anyone who is interested who is in the Northwest region of Pennsylvania, I am the Northwest region hub for the Pennsylvania Environmental Literacy Steering Committee. So I would love to get you together into our Environmental Literacy Coalition. Um, we're looking for professionals, formal, non-formal educators, students. We'd love to get student voice in there and to come together so we can network and support each other and join forces to help our local environment. And then again, at the IU, there's links here to our STEM lending library. And I have an Act 48 professional development opportunity coming up at our IU5 in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania on May 15th. Um, it's going to be diving into those stream study kits, taking a look at all those things that you can have for your classroom and how you could tie those into your MeWays. Then again, the bit.ly is there if you'd like any of the information from the slides. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and turn it back over to Amber. Thanks, Rebecca. Just gonna give a moment for questions to come in. Um, Carl asks, will re participants receive a replay of the webinar? And yes, uh, we will provide the recording. It'll be on our website. Tim, do you have any questions while I'm checking the chat? 
Sure, I think it's really neat how programs transfer from one watershed to another and everybody kind of learns off of each other. And a lot of those same lessons are very applicable inside of the, um, in the Pennsylvania Lake Erie Basin. Uh, I guess my question would be, um, Rebecca, um, what, what types of things do you, do you do that are kind of specific to this area that you've kind of, you know, maybe been able to transfer to other areas? Well, that's a great question, Tim. And to be honest, I'm newer to this position. I've been at the IU for about a year and a half, but I've only been in the environmental literacy position for, well, since the beginning of this year. Um, but I'm definitely working on building my hub with all of my local experts. So we're really gonna be looking into issues, whether it's at Presque Isle or somewhere here around the Great Lakes. And um, so I guess to be, to be continued, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have a great answer at this moment. No, there's tons of opportunity there and we're, we're happy to connect you. I'm sure you have a lot of connections already, um, but happy to do anything to, to help facilitate that. Thank you. There are a couple questions in the chat for you, Rebecca. Um, Sarah Jennings asks if you can add her to your newsletters. And so I will uh, let you guys make a connection, maybe offline or through chat, um, to set that up. And Sarah Bennett would like to know if you can provide examples of the civic actions. Absolutely, I will add those in there. And Carl is asking, will attendees get a certificate of attendance? Um, I'm not sure if, if Carl is talking about this webinar or uh, the, the resources that Rebecca mentioned. Uh, for this webinar, if you fill out the survey that will come to your email after the webinar is over, you will be able to get a certificate of attendance. And um, Rebecca, I'm, you did mention that um, Act 48 credits could be received for that MIWI training um, through receipt of uh, a, a certificate. Yes, there is that MeWe 101 training and Act 48 is available. Um, and then we also have an Act 48 professional development coming up at the IU5 in May. Great. Um, I'm curious about the coalition that you mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more about their, um, their mission and initiatives? Sure. So the coalition is, as I said, part of our statewide hub, and we are split up into six different regions, and it's the same six regions that are used for the PAEE, which is the Pennsylvania Association of Environmental Educators. So I'm the hub leader of the Northwest region, and we're really just working on getting things kicked off, um, bringing everyone together. And um, Michelle, you have been very, very helpful in working and taking a huge role um, in the statewide steering committee. If you wanna add more here, just so I'm not missing any of our key points. <laughs> yeah. So the slide that I showed about the Pennsylvania Environmental Literacy Network. Um, so there are PIs of which Pennsylvania Sea Grant is one of the PIs in partnership with the Pennsylvania Department of Education and the Stroud Water Research Center. So the three of our programs are PIs on the NOAA BWET grant that is funding the statewide Pennsylvania Environmental Literacy Capacity Building Network. <laughs> I don't have an, an acronym for all of that. So um, and, uh, you know, within that structure, we have the six regional hubs. Uh, as Rebecca mentioned, she is one of the hub leaders for the Northwest region. There is a North Central, a Northeast, and then Southeast, South, uh, South Central, and Southwest. And within those hubs, we have um, hub liaisons who are bringing together uh, regional coalitions of interested parties, um, area experts, uh, volunteers, folks who are interested in advancing environmental literacy in one capacity or another. We're also working to address diversity in all ways across the Commonwealth. Um, and so making sure that, that local voices are heard as we um, work towards environmental literacy across the state. And uh, as this year, um, it became very apparent that we were missing the youth voice. And so youth voice, um, high school students probably, maybe undergrad students as well, will be part of these regional hubs when and where appropriate. Um, and we also have an outside 
well, not outside, we have a statewide stakeholders network that will also inform both the steering committee, the PIs, and the regional hubs. And so um, the grant is two years, uh, but we do hope um, to make some great progress. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions uh, about the, the statewide steering committee as well um, and regional hubs too. Great, thank you so much. And Rebecca, would you like to provide those uh, civic action examples live or do you wanna type them? Entirely up to you. I was working on typing them. Um, I haven't seen any civic action ones done personally yet. I'm really hoping next school year I can be involved in, uh, with other schools in our area. Um, I know that there's all different types of things that have been done. And one of the things that we can offer support on at the IU5, and I know Michelle and others on the statewide committee is working with school districts, pardon me, school districts to help um, schools establish a district-wide environmental literacy plan. So that's something where the students could have their voices heard, maybe at a school board meeting, speaking out and trying to get a plan made that could be sustainable, carried on throughout making the school a better place for everyone with those environmental initiatives. Um, but even things like that on a local level, speaking up within the community to try to make a lasting change. So it's not just out there um, cleaning up a stream, we're trying to do something to make lasting effort that sustainable change. Go ahead, Michelle. Thanks. Um, just to give a couple of quick examples, I mean, these, these civic actions can often be tied to academic standards in civics and social studies. And so it's really important to realize that environmental literacy and sustainability and the PA steel standards are not just the PA steel standards, they are cross cutting across more disciplines, including language arts and social studies and humanities and, and art and music. I mean, you really can take these things anywhere. Um, and the me we can cross these disciplines as well. And so civic action can include simple personal things like personal statements and personal pledges to, you know, things like turn out the lights when you leave the room, turn off the water when you brush your teeth. Um, but it could also include items like letter writing campaigns, which are, you know, for policy decisions. Um, it could be presenting in front of a school board. It could be presenting in front of city council. Um, you know, uh, there the options are really quite endless when you start thinking about civic action and, and stewardship behaviors. And so those are just a few simple examples, but we've seen some really elaborate, like, and again, it's not like a one and done kind of situation. This is a MeWe framework, you know, can span an entire school year, it can span a grade band. Um, and so, you know, you really can think big, you can think across grades, you can think across curriculum when you're when you're working on these types of um, programs. That is wonderful. Thank you both. Tim, do you have any other thoughts or questions? Those are really interesting examples of civic actions. And I think, you know, when you start talking about what types of actions can be done on the ground, really speaking to our municipalities is, is, is you know, one of those great ones, trying to inspire change either from, you know, green infrastructure or having a, a lower impact on our surroundings as we develop outwards from our cities. And so, no, thank you very much. much. That is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm seeing a lot of connection in the chat, which I'm just thrilled about. So I hope that continues. Um, and we will move forward with our day. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Jeanette Schnars, the Executive Director of the Regional Science Consortium. And she's going to be sharing with us education that occurs at the Regional Science Consortium. Okay, thank you very much, Amber. I appreciate the introduction and the invite to be part of this meeting today. Um, get everything set up here and ready to go. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of talk to everybody about our organization. The Can you see my slides, Amber? Is that up? Yep, looks good. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Regional Science Consortium, we are based out at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center, and we're made up of a um, consortium of organizations. There we go. 
Okay, so um, at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center, we are at the base or gateway to Presque Isle State Park on the shores of uh, Lake Erie. And we are a nonprofit organization um, and we are really focused on facilitating facilitating research, education, and collaboration with our members. So our membership is made up of colleges and universities, school districts, state and federal agencies, and other nonprofits. We have about 37 members now, a dozen of which are school districts. So we are um, really interacting with them not only throughout the school year, but across the summer as well. If we're not interacting with the students, we're interacting with the teachers during that time. And our focus really is to try to take all of this research that we are conducting throughout the year and create these educational programs um, that really highlight what we're doing and what's going on in our backyard in terms of um, uh, scientific research and uh, just getting students aware of Lake Erie, but not only aquatic type of research, we are looking at wetlands, at plants, at invasive plants. Um, we're even looking at shipwrecks. And so just to have them really value what is right here in their own environment. So I always find it interesting that if you talk to an elementary school um, student and ask them if they could name, you know, five things that live in the ocean. They could do it pretty quickly, but if you ask them to uh, name five fish that live in Lake Erie, it's a little more challenging. And so I'm um, just creating that, that sense of, you know, where they are and what their surroundings include. So when we look at our membership, um, we are extended throughout Pennsylvania, of course, concentrated a lot right here um, around Erie County. And But you can see we extend down into the Pittsburgh area, and we're on the other side of the state, including Tunkhannock School District and Wilkes University. Um, and we're even branching out even farther on a geographic scale down into South Carolina. Um, a lot of our programs that we've had, we've had teachers contact us from you know, across the country and even internationally to participate in. And so we really value that idea of immersive learning experiences. And some of those examples that we've had, we've been able to implement through our multiple NOAA B wet grants and really capitalizing on that idea of MIWIs. Um, both, you know, being that we are in Erie, Pennsylvania, we have four seasons. And so, you know, sometimes we can get outside. We even take them outside to the beach in March, which was really, I felt like one of our best field trips. Um, but even getting into, like I said, we do things with shipwrecks. And so, you know, we had a whole program where we did it at the YMCA pool in Warren with Warren County School District students. And we had them try scuba. We had them do a mock um, inventory of a shipwreck. Um, we had a couple different activities there. So we try to, even if we can't get outside, kind of, um, you know, have a, a I don't know, recreation of that inside as much as possible. Um, some of the topics that we focus on, you can see here, but definitely the fisheries, water quality, harmful algal blooms is another really important topic that we've been working on for years and have done a lot of education and outreach, um, stormwater, and then the invasive and native plants um, is something that we've been focused on throughout the years. So of course, MIWIs, you've already heard a lot about MIWIs and um, we thank the NOAA Be Wet program for their funding over the last several years that has given us the opportunity to work with teachers and really educate them to the point where they feel very comfortable with the material and so that they can incorporate that right into the classroom. Um, so it's giving them that confidence where we take them out in the field during the summer and have them seining for fish, um, restoring wetlands, doing different activities there, and just getting really good understanding. And so, you know, with all these actions, just like students, um, the teachers really have a better idea, um, learn, and just, you know, really feel comfortable with teaching their own students that. 
So um, you can see here that is actually Amber um, teaching some of our teachers, and um, it was a great experience. And you know they still value that today, and they still incorporate it into their classes today, where we can we are invited to you know support them and provide guest lectures and things like that, or even continue those MeWe experiences on their campus at their schools, or bringing them out to Presque Isle State Park and on the park. Some of the things that have resulted from these MIWIs um, is stewardship action projects. So again, how do the students get involved and take it to the next step, incorporate it into their own lives, you know, where it's more than just something they learn in a book and take a test on. And so we want it to be very relevant to their community. We want them to think about how they can, as individuals, be part of the solution um, and how to make their voices heard, whether it's in their school community or in their township or even more so. And so we had really two outstanding groups over the years um, that really just went above and beyond um, the Iroquois Elementary School District. They really dug into this recycling plastic bags doing a research project on it at the grocery store and getting their entire school, their elementary school, which is K through six recycling. Um, they recycled like 80,000 plastic bags in not even a school year, it was like half a school year. And so all of this efforts that they did, um, they submitted to the um, Pennsylvania Governor's Award of Environmental Excellence and they did receive an award and you can see that in the top picture there very proud students, very proud teachers. Um, the school district, of course, still talks about that. And Northeast Elementary School is similar situation. They um, work on part of their stewardship action project was to create these storm drain markers, work with a local metal shop um, to fabricate them and started putting them on the storm drains not only on their campus, but at a local park as well, um, and really publicizing it, reaching out to the community. And they too, when we worked with them, applied for the governor's award and also received it. We also have what we call the interactive wetland model. So like I said, um, wetland, is, wetland restoration is a really important project that we've been working on for over a decade now at Presque Isle State Park. And at Presque Isle, we have nationally recognized priority wetlands. And so that has allowed us to get funding to help continue to restore them. Um, when I take students out to a wetland, one, it is weather dependent because, you know, here in Erie, Pennsylvania, the weather can be anything at any time. Um, but also, it's hard to describe functions of a wetland or the different things they might see in the wetland um, where they just they might not see it at that moment in time that I take them out. So we created what's called the interactive wetland model. And that's the bottom photo there that is in our aquatics lab in the research wing where we are housed at the Tom Ridge Environmental Center. And um, we have our turtle tanks kind of incorporated into this, but we're showing an urban, suburban, and rural setting. And we're showing all of these different ways that pollution can enter a waterway or a system and kind of go into that wetland and then how that wetland functions to alleviate some of those pollution pressures or water velocity pressures or sedimentation to the lake. And so this is something that we, we can control. We can't necessarily take them out in the field and control if they're going to see certain types of birds or amphibians or fishes or turtles, but we can control some of that here and give them um, you know, a good visual, but also let them interact with this. So you'll see there's a tube that goes across either side and tubes that run up and down. And it's showing how all of these are inputs into the wetland, which is in the center. So they use ping pong balls to show all the different pollution, whether it's nutrient pollution from cow manure or urban pollution from a factory. And then we kind of go to that wetland area in the center and really talk about how the wetland is, is doing its job and those functions that it has. Field experience is incredibly important for us. So again, getting them out, um, really experiencing things. So seining for fish um, out on the boats. We have, uh, we work closely with Gannon University to get them out on the Environaut boat. Um, we also work with Fish and Boat Commission to show them electroshocking so they can actually see all these different fishes that we have really just right off the shore. 
and um, seining and also looking at the wetlands and the plants and how all of this works together. And so they get the experience of using different types of field equipment, as simple as a secchi disc, a plankton tow, a kemmer tube, a sond, um, all of these things, it gives them that hands-on experience and we give each student the opportunity to take these samples. Again, with field experience, we're out there, we're looking at the plants, kind of feeling them, smelling them, you know, really when they walk through the wetland, they don't always, you know, realize there's so many different species and this is how you can tell them apart. Um, just getting them into the water, again, that is things that they will remember. And I can guarantee in the bottom right corner, that student right there that is holding that huge carp, um, he had worked out at the peninsula at the canoe livery right on the water for years and years, and he had no idea any of these things that we were showing him on the peninsula um, and never saw fish like this. So it was a very exciting moment, which I know they are all still remembered to this day. We also host a couple events at um, the Regional Science Consortium. And so the first one is the Problem Solving Hackathon. And this is where we have students come in. They work as teams. We reveal a problem when they come. Um, one year, it was the decline in pollinators. We have experts in the field come and do lightning talks, so like five-minute lectures to give them the background knowledge that they need. And then we give them an hour to kind of focus on one aspect of the problem and develop a solution. And then we give them another hour to go ahead and build a PowerPoint to talk about their solution, but then to build a prototype. So the first photo you see on the left, that is all kinds of material, cardboard, zip ties, tape, whatever. And they build their solution and then they present it to um, the experts, you know, uh, judges and kind of explain how they are going to solve not the whole problem, but one aspect of that problem. And it is um, really good to get them thinking creatively outside the box. Um, the younger students are just more free with how they think and how they come up with these solutions. And so it is just a great activity. It is one of our most popular events that fills up every year. And we've been doing it for about six years now. Even through COVID, we were able to do this. Um, so it's a great opportunity for these students. The other event that is one of our most popular, which in fact we just did today, I just got done with this at two o'clock, um, is our Forensic Science Escape Room. And this came about because so many of our students were interested in going into that major. And so we worked with the local university to talk about what are the scientific experiments that a forensic scientist uses to analyze a crime, crime scene. Um, but it's also giving them problem solving skills. And so they come in, they work as teams, they go through three rooms, each room has 10 stations, they come up with all these answers, put it all together for this final riddle and try to solve the who done it. Um, yes, we usually have a murder. I asked, asked the teachers, is this okay to, you know, do this? And they're like, yes, this is, you know, they love it. It's great. Um, so again, it's really good teamwork, really good STEM. We always integrate science into every aspect of this. Um, and the students, we had students today that are in ninth grade that did this when they were in fifth grade or fourth grade. So it was exciting to see them back. We also have what's called the College Prep Workshop Series, and the goal here is to bridge that gap between high school and college. There is a big transition from being a senior in high school to being a freshman in college, and so we work with our college partners and members um, to get students in the high school range, which does range from 7 to 12 because of our different high school um, setups. And so just developing a resume, a college application, how to write essays, how to do job interviews, English 101. When you walk into an English class freshman year, first day, what's the syllabus look like? How fast are they going to go over this material? How are you going to be graded? And just giving these students kind of some preparation. Um, and so I'm so happy this year we got to reinstate this program in person again, which has been fantastic. And the students earn a free dual enrollment class at Gannon University if they participate. They're expected to do all three sessions during the school year and then participate in consecutive years. And then currently we have a grant with um, Pennsylvania DEP Environmental Education. And we are working with um, seven different classrooms 
to um, have them do the audits to move them towards becoming an eco school. And so the audits they're focusing on are is watershed, water conservation, climate change, and energy. We give them the tools and the guidance to do these audits at their school. They identify something that needs to be improved and we give them a budget um, to make, you know, select an improvement to make that improvement. Um, we hope from this that that'll give them the mo momentum to continue to um, apply not only for an eco school program through the National Wildlife Federation, but also for the Education Green Ribbon Schools. Um, and so a lot of this um, participation started halfway through the school year, but it has been very successful. And then as member of the Regional Science Consortium, our school districts have a lot of different experiences and opportunities. And we try to, we realize every school district is different. And so we might um, customize what we do, but we offer job shadowing experiences, um, help or support with any type of research projects students might wanna work on. And then also class field trips and lab experiences and internships. When co actually before COVID hit, we are working on the education initiative where we have the um, 12 lessons that you see there. Each of these lessons are things that can be done by the teacher online, give them all of the tools as well as the kits that they need for the materials. Um, they all include a narrated PowerPoint video activity, worksheet, teacher's guide, and the opportunity to Skype with a scientist. And so we do have that in-person um, interaction with the students. And so even after COVID and everybody was back in school, we really did not have the opportunity to get back in the classroom because of different restrictions at different schools. And so not we try to um, still have a presence, a live presence with them. Now, although this coincided and happened right when COVID did, which seemed to be um, beneficial, we were really developing this for our long distance membership. So like I said, we have schools on the other side of the state that we're working with, and this gives them the opportunity to work on these projects, even from a long distance when we can't just, you know, drive across town to get to their school. So that long distance membership, um, that is something that if anybody was interested in, please don't hesitate to contact me. And like I said, we can customize the package to really make it fit you and your students in your classroom. Um, but the idea is just to make it as immersive as possible. Um, and then if you are closer to us, so even I mentioned Warren County, they are members of the consortium and they came up to the Forensic Science Escape Room today. If you are closer to us, then we can talk about um, kind of a, what that membership looks like. And so please, if you have any questions, do not hesitate to reach out to me. Um, we are expanding our education program tremendously over the last year and uh, this upcoming year. And we are really increasing the number of school districts that are becoming members. And with our membership being uh, so diverse, it really allows us to integrate colleges, universities, school districts, um, state and federal agencies. It allows us to do a lot of different things and overlap those um, members to do different events. Thank you. Thank you, Jeanette. I'm gonna check the chat for questions and Tim, if you have questions, I'm not sure. Thank you, Jeanette, for the presentation. I think it kind of, everyone is amazed whenever they see all of the things that the Regional Science Consortium does. Um, you know, just so everyone on the call knows today, uh, the consortium really helps out state and federal agencies in understanding what's going on inside of our air and water um, and on our land. And uh, that entire body of work is in addition to, um, to educating this really wide spectrum uh, of, of people, anywhere from you know, young children to, to young adults. So uh, you know, I guess just kind of a kickoff question, you know, can you talk about um, you know, kind of the, the more, your, your opportunities and how you provide them in the context of age? Um, it's, you know, that wide spectrum uh, of ages, why do you feel that that's important, um, you know, for it to be adaptable and customizable? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's, um, 
I really think it's interesting how at very young age students are just naturally interested in science so that can be just a lot of fun to bring students out get them out on the park get them in the lab I mean we have students um, we do work a lot of times with gifted coordinators because they can bring their students out um, easier than um, other teachers that you know have to stay in the classroom and so they they are required to give their students those opportunities outside of the classroom. And so we really look at, you know, those younger students, they can be inspired by, um, I didn't realize like what a spotted gar looks like. That's the coolest fish ever, you know, didn't know we had anything like that just right in the lagoons. Um, we can hopefully inspire some curiosity. And we do say that we, you know, realize not everybody wants to be a scientist, but we all need to appreciate the environment, the ecology around us, because whether we take that down, go down that road as a career, or we are just a voting member of our community, um, the environmental issues in our community affect everybody. And so we need to just be a little bit knowledgeable on that. And then when we look at the older students, um, middle school students are still very open to learning all of these different things. High school students, they might really be going down that track of very interested in environmental science or ecology or marine biology. And so then we can really dig in deeper and give them one-on-one -on -one experiences or work with them on a research project um, that they might need for their school or for a statewide competition. Um, and then we can also start connecting them with faculty at colleges or introducing them to colleges that have these programs. And so we, we really try to think about what their interests are at that age and then you know, serve those. And it, and it is important work. Um, perhaps maybe the most important is the escape room. I think that sounds really fun um, to, to check out the escape room sometime. Um, I might it have is to, one to of pop our, in. Yeah, it is one of our most popular. And um, when we started that, it was, you know, all of these shows on TV, like CSI, um, we went to people, faculty, professors that teach forensic science. And we said, what we see on TV, is that really true? And the one comment that sticks out is we never show up to a crime scene in high heels. That's just ridiculous, you know? <laughs> um, but we really wanted to take those labs and the science and so that students can see what the forensic science truly looks like as a college student or as a career and not the Hollywood version of it. But it is a lot of fun and it was very competitive today. And they are very excited when they figure out who the killer is or who done it. And those people often get a um, good razzing. <laughs> I bet. I know Amber uh, knows a lot about the programs at the consortium, being with you for several years. Um, Amber, I'll, I'll kind of turn it over to you for further questions. Or do we have anything on the chat right now? There's nothing coming through in the chat or the Q&A, uh, but I, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about uh, the different um, uh, topics that have been focused on for hackathon. Yes, um, hackathon is great because we get to change the topic every year. So one year it was um, pollinators that are in decline. One year it was water quality. One year it was HABs. One year it was um, kind of like wetlands and pollution runoff. And, you know, with, with like the harmful algal blooms, some of the students are like, why can't we just vacuum them out of the lake or just, you know, filter the whole lake? And so again, like getting them to get some perspective on the whole lake is a really big mass amount of water. Um, and so that, but they come up with these really unique um, approaches, which is, which is great. So it just gets them very creatively thinking of how to solve a problem. And that's what secretly we're trying to get them to do is work as a team. <laughs> and they're not always inclined to want to work as a team, but they have all have different roles and then solve the problem um, focused to the best of their ability with the capabilities that, that we have. You know what I think is interesting about that, uh, especially the hackathon, is that it causes us who are regulators um, or scientists 
some of the things that can't come up from the kids that that you know that they invent or create or different ways of looking at problems sometimes we don't think of them in that that concept but when they say just well why don't we just filter the whole lake well yeah I, we can't really do that but you know when you start thinking about down down that line of possibilities what are things that we haven't thought about uh from that line of reasoning and um and so i think it's good for everybody in that that exercise it is and we never tell them no we just make them think about it more and they make us think about it more so sometimes we have to come up with good answers and they're like what about and then you know you're like well that's true what about that that's not a bad you know comeback <laughs> <laughs> that's great and what i think is so valuable about all of these experiences across any miwi that's conducted is just the connection with your local environment like you talked so much about experiencing your own backyard and I know, you know, from working with students, a lot of them have never really seen Lake Erie or they've never touched a frog or picked up a turtle or seen these things in person. So it's it's really a testament to how important uh, the work that you're doing is. Thank you. And thank you for all your help throughout the years. A lot of the programs were developed over the course of the last five to eight years and Amber was um, very involved in all of those. And so we we definitely have a successful record and we're gonna continue that into the future. It's always a joy to see old photos of me working with kids. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, we are going to take just a quick five minute break. So uh, before we move on to our next presenter, so it is currently 357. Uh, come back around 402. So stretch, get a drink of water, and we'll see you soon. Hi everyone, I'll give you a couple seconds to return. And while you're coming back, don't forget to check out all of the great information that's uh, that's being popped into the chat and the Q&A. We've got several resources from the Flora Rose um, Watershed Education Center from Diane and the Pennsylvania Sea Grant information popped in by Michelle to the chat. Uh, so don't forget to check all of that information out if you're interested about more of these projects. I also uh, put Jeanette's email into the chat. So if you're interested in reaching out to her about anything that the RSC has to offer, please feel free to do that. Um, so we are recording again, and I'm going to get us moved on to our next speakers. Uh, so I'm happy to introduce Mike Domino and Hillary Henwood. They are teachers from the School District of Philadelphia, and today they'll be talking about Seagull in the Classroom and creating accessible enrichment. So Mike and Hillary, I will turn it over to you. Hello. <laughs> Let's just uh, share our screen. Can everybody see our slideshow? Yeah, we can. Looks good. So I'm Mike Domino. And Hillary Henwood from John Moffat Elementary School. Um, I am an autism support teacher for grades three to fifth. Mike is K to five technology and makerspace. And we both work here at John Moffat Elementary School. So uh, as a Philadelphia school in Kensington, we don't have a lot of resources, so we um, leverage partnerships constantly to bring in STEM to our school. So these are this year's partners that we're working with to help us bring in nature-based STEM into our classrooms. Uh, we have an ongoing partnership now with Fox Chase Farms, which is a Philadelphia school. So we have field trips there weekly. Um, that's where we're hoping to conduct our MeWe, which we'll get to eventually. 
Uh, we also take part every year in the Pico Exelon Energy Innovation Challenge, and we'll show you, we used that as our MeWe last year, which uh, our fourth grade team won. Uh, we work with Lehigh University using geographic information system um, with MeWe. Fairmount Waterworks is our local water center, so we're, they have their own curriculum. Uh, we also work with Riverbend, which is an environmental center, Let's Go Outdoors, Land Health Institute, PAC Grant, and Strouds. So these are all um, educational partners we work with. And uh, this is pictures from our nature club this year, um, which we got funding through, the school district got funding through a grant and there's uh, Michelle coming in to represent as PAC Grant, uh, working with uh, tying uh, hooks to fish lines. So last year's MeWe, um, we had our students uh, work through the process and we have uh, websites and things we can share in the chat and they're on uh, the slideshow. We had our students do a watershed audit so that they could start to identify issues local to them and then plan how they could then uh, address the issues. So they did their audit um, to do some research. We have a school podcast club that focuses on STEM. They interviewed a uh, park ranger from John Hines about uh, watershed issues. Then they did some building activities in their maker space, like the uh, street sweeper Lego has a image there. They ultimately decided they wanted to address uh, runoff into the rivers and clean the rivers. We did a few other things listed on the slide. <laughs> uh, so our final product was the river cleaning boats. Let's see if we can probably have our kiddos represent their MeWe. Okay. We'll let them explain the process. It's a lot cuter <laughs> and better when they do it. Again, this involves uh, all of STEM, so science, technology, et cetera. It's all Hi, I am Marco. And I'm Delilah. This year, Moffitt's fourth grade classes took part in the Pico Energizing Education Program Innovation Challenge. To do so, we looked at the effects of global warming on our community. We found that one of the effects of global warming was heavier rains. This, this led to problems with flooding and other stresses on our water plant with runoff. In our podcast club, our teammates in, interviewed Ranger Kelly of John Price at Telecom. We asked what things we could do to help maintain a healthy watershed. After the interview, we decided that runoff was a major issue. To see how, how our school was affected and how we could, in, we, we could innovate Solutions. We performed the watershed audit. We looked at where water would run into our yard and if what if it would come out. We noticed that trash flowed to certain areas of the schoolyard and are working to put new trash cans in those spaces as a short term solution. In our watershed audit, we also looked at our local wildlife and noticed areas with less green space and more runoff, like puddles and trash bills. We are working with our family school organization, our teachers, and school grants departments to design and build more green space at the far side of our school where the where the most water runs off. In the meantime, our FSO students cleaned up the, the yard this spring. In our classroom as a design team, we designed Lego free sweepers to clean the yard. That was the buildup for a big project. In teams, we built river cleaning boats. We used materials wisely, and as everything had a price, and we did not want to be wasted. Our classmates worked together and designed, built, and tested river cleaning boats. Our goal was to design boats that could someday keep our rivers 
clean up, run up, and other situations. The lowest cost boat that cleaned the river this is our winning design. The school year isn't over, so we may take another shot at re redesigning our best boat to improve our boat. Thank you for watching our presentation. Bye. See ya. Clean the river! <laughs> that was our clean the river right. challenge. We also did it with adults. So yeah, we did it uh, with three to fifth graders and then we did with the adults and the adults were just as excited as the kiddos when we presented to them. Uh, so this year, uh, through our partnerships, one of the things uh, PAC grant helped fund is helping us fund training. So, <laughs> oh, I'm currently taking a beekeeping class. Uh, super excited from the Philadelphia uh, Beekeepers Guild. It is partially online and in person, so I'm pretty excited to get involved with um, our buzzing little friends. Uh, we're also taking a fishing trip with Let's Go Outdoors. That's um, with our uh, nature club because once they tied the hooks, um, that's all they want to do now is go fishing. And we're getting water testing kits from Stroud through the funding from PA Secret. Uh, we're also we're starting a video game esports lab, and we're trying to make it uh, as diverse as possible. So in the game room, we're also getting. Um, nature video games, uh, like real fishing, sea exploration, farming simulator, things like that, um, that will help with science journaling, help the kids do some like pseudo outdoor activities and simulations and bring in the tech aspect of this. So they're also gonna start designing their own video games and this will help them um, with that design aspect. Uh, for our MIWI 2023, we're um, gonna look at macro invertebrates Fox Chase Farms using iNaturalist and a few other um, like, uh, creek critters and a few other maps to see what works best and check the health of the streams at Fox Chase. Uh, moving forward next year, like each year we're building up through our partnerships. We're hoping to have trouts in the classroom and mussels in the classroom from Fairmount. Um, we did get a grant, if you heard the kids in the um, Last year's me, we, we did get a grant for outdoor seating. So we are building up our outdoor classroom environment. We were turned out for our greenhouse, but we are working on Still that. Pushing. That's a red tape from Philadelphia School District that we're <laughs> determined to cut through. Um, so that will happen ultimately. Um, see, we were um, able to put aquaponics in our autistic support classes, uh, K to two and three to five, as well as our fourth and fifth grade science classes. Uh, we're doing wind energy at Fox Chase uh, this week, and we are bringing in more nature-based uh, STEM educators onto our podcast. And some of the tech resources and things we've brought in through our partnerships, the Vernier probes to test water health using our uh, Chromebooks, uh, trail cams for when we make bird feeders and bat boxes. Uh, that's the river or the leaf kits, um, some Vernier uh, wind and anemometers and digital microscopes, some that are um, for the field that center one would be, um, creates a little Wi-Fi field. So we're able to, when we're on site, share the image from the microscope to six iPads at a time. So we're all able to see what we're looking at together. And just more information, we have our MeWe website which I don't know if we have time to share. We have the website here that walks you through all the, the MeWe's we've done last year and doing this year and all things we do with our STEM nature club, including composting, recycling, uh, vermiculture. Uh, we're starting what, um, praying mantises soon. Praying in the mantis, garden. ladybugs, butterflies. And we have a story map that walks you through that as well. That's what we're doing at Moffitt. Yeah. Feel free to reach out with any questions or concerns, comments. We are both available.
Uh, thank you, Hillary and Mike. And, you know, you, you said that there weren't a lot of resources in the school. It seems like they have two excellent resources at Moffitt, both of you. Um, thank you for your commitment and, and the amount of work that I, I know you do um, on an everyday basis. Um, you know, just looking at some of the activities you guys are, are, are putting into place there, there's a lot. Um, and I think what often gets lost is how do we translate this um, into, into different formats for students at different levels? And, you know, Hillary, you said that you're, um, you're a teacher in an autism support classroom. Can you talk a little bit about how you adapt some of these concepts to help, you know, spur imaginations inside your classroom? Um, sure. Uh, I have eight students, all are boys, so that definitely helps with anything science. Um, uh, Mike and I do a lot of before and after school clubs. And because my kiddos cannot usually stay or come in early for these clubs, I bring whatever we do in the club into the classroom as part of their academic day. From that point, I will take it and I will uh, plug in their math, reading, and writing. But if you give any student anything hands-on, they're, they're going to love it. My kiddos, they play with worms, bugs. We were planting seeds on Friday. It's a lot easier than than it seems. Yeah, I think when you get to play with things, um, you know, in the classroom, it, it makes it a lot easier for the time to pass, first and foremost. Gets everybody interested um, in, in, in what's being discussed. Are there some things that you think that you've done there at Moffitt that, that, um, that maybe others in other schools are, are, are not doing or maybe not, not have had success with that you're experiencing success with? Yeah, I feel like like the, the partnerships, a lot of, I mean, it does take a lot of time outside of what we're normally expected to do. But in order to bring these things in, it's a lot of grant writing and partnerships. And um, we do find that those things get easier the more you do. Like if you start out with something simple like donors choose projects, it takes less time and then start working to build up your grants and make partnerships. The more you're doing, the more support you get because people see like, oh, you guys are invested in nature STEM. You are taking kids outside for a garden. So here's a garden for you. So they see mm -hmm. that you're doing it and if that becomes easier over time. You maybe have to start in kitty steps, but we have, you know, we, we're building a game room this year and that probably wouldn't be happening if we didn't have a maker space. And that also led to a media hub. So, which was built from the podcast from stuff from the maker space. So just building, building, building um, really helps. You know, also in, on, in that line of thinking, you, know, you have mentioned, you know, the administration of these grants is a lot of work. Applying for these grants is a lot of work. Keeping people on the same page is a lot of work. Building things physically um, is a lot of work. How do you stay motivated? Um, how do you, you know, it's it, understanding, you know, everyone runs into challenges in their everyday jobs. Um, I, I certainly understand how challenging administrative and red tape types of issues are. You know, talk about your experience a little bit uh, on, on how you deal with that. Uh, I think we keep ourselves motivated. Um, not only is Mike my, my work partner, but we're constantly talking on nights and weekends and whenever the thought comes up. So it's really nice to have a partner where you can bounce some things off of. Um, I think most importantly, when the student has that aha moment, we kind of look at each other and we give each other a wink and we're like, oh, we did it. Now this kiddo understands what we are teaching. It helps to have a supportive uh, admin too. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, there was no, uh, without referring anybody, we didn't have supportive admin here. And over time, like our current administrator sees the stuff we're doing and he basically just says yes to everything we do <laughs> because we get results. So that's super helpful. Um, another way to stay motivated is to have, you don't have to be an expert in everything especially with STEM. So aside from like bringing those partnerships, bringing in other teachers in the room, 
is helpful. And my, uh, more teachers will reach out to us as they see we're doing things like, hey, how do you guys do that? Or can we try this with you in the makerspace? And, uh, that's super motivating mm -hmm. as well. Excellent. Amber, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation. And I, I absolutely love that video that you shared. It was super impactful. And it's always great to hear from the students directly uh, what they're working on. Um, there is a question in the chat. Were you able to facilitate student-led civic action? So uh, we're working on that. We did. Um, we are still working on our outdoor classroom grants, but we're using what the kids found from their um, energy audit or the watershed audit. We're using that to help plan the green space and get more outdoor trash cans. We did get the outdoor seating already. Um, and we do have uh, a pitch night through the, the grants department because through all the grants we're getting, the grants department like is reaching out to us now. So we belong to the school resource academy this year. Uh, we're gonna bring out elected officials and we're going to um, some night in May we're going to show them what the kids did and show them where we want the green space. We're also going to push for a green roof, which the district is telling us absolutely not. <laughs> we're like, no, we're doing it. So uh, we're going to have Ms. Henwood's kids and a few others show, um, demonstrate the benefits of a green roof and what they found in their watershed island and hopefully get that outdoor space filled up even. Thank you, thank you. Um, there are a couple wonderful comments in here that I just, I, I feel empowered to read. Tara says that she loves your determination. And Sarah says, wow, way to empower student voices and empower them as citizens. And I couldn't agree more. And I, I think uh, my question is, for a teacher who's just looking to start this or, or take their first steps into a project work like this, do you have any advice for them? Uh, I would always, I start small. So uh, my first years at Moffitt, uh, just getting it, starting uh, steam from just working in a tech lab, I broke into an empty classroom to build roller coasters mm -hmm. without letting my admin know, because I know mm -hmm. if I asked, she would have said no. So do what you can, when you can, strike when the iron's hot. So she came in and saw us building roller coasters. She heard the kids having a blast. But I couldn't get in trouble because the kids there were were kids building fun. roller coasters. So she kind of left me alone. But starting striking while the iron's hot. So find little energy challenges online. Uh, subscribe to if your school district has a science newsletter or a grants department. Mm -hmm. Follow them closely and just look at what you can do with the time you have. Um, know your school's demographics. Know your special ed population. Your ELL learners because you can always work that in the grants because you want to reach everybody. But aim small, to, aim where, well, I, we aim big too, but aim <laughs> where, where you're comfortable and you just keep chugging away. And if you can't, uh, our first energy challenge um, with Pico, the money for our project didn't come in on time. So again, Philadelphia School District Red, Red Team. So we built with, we built little mini greenhouses from the dollars. So you just, work with what you have and you, you'll still get amazing results. And then again, everything builds if you just keep chipping away. Don't be afraid to take chances. Yeah. The worst they can say is no, and then you move on. Yeah. That's wonderful advice. And um, I'm not seeing any other questions come in from the chat or the Q&A, but if you guys see them pop in there, feel free to answer them directly. And thank you so much for your time today. What a wonderful presentation. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Okay, and we will now move into the second segment of our uh, LEAF Forum today. And the second segment is mostly focused on volunteering in Pennsylvania. So if you were inspired by what you've heard here so far today regarding uh, working with students, whether you're an informal or formal teacher, um, if you're not a teacher and you're just listening to this and you really want to get involved, a great way to do that is to volunteer your time. 
Um, so we're going to hear from several volunteer programs next to uh, really give you an understanding of how you can get involved in uh, what's happening across Pennsylvania. So uh, first up, we have Natalie Marioni. She is an extension leader with Penn State Extension, and she will be talking to us about extending community learning through volunteer engagement. So Natalie, I will let you take it away. My mute button moved <laughs> on me when I started my screen share. So hopefully you can hear me and um, Amber, you can see my slide, correct? Yes and yes. Great. Um, so those will be some hard presentations to follow, especially with that that youth energy. Um, but hopefully um, you all will get a lot out of this one as well. Um, so just um, just reiterate, so my name is Natalie Marioni. I am the coordinator for the Master Watershed Steward Program for both Berks and Schuylkill counties. And I'm also the Master Well Owner Network uh, Volunteer Coordinator. So I won't be talking about the first one that will come in the presentation by Aaron next, but I will be talking briefly about the, about the Master Well Owner Network volunteer position um, or volunteer program. Um, but I did want to mention quickly, um, if you need this presentation or would like this presentation in a different format, feel free to reach out to me. My contact information will be on the last slide, um, and I can provide that to you. Um, and I think it's really important to understand kind of where this project and these programs are coming from. Um, and to do that, you need to understand that this is part of who we are at Penn State Extension. So. Penn State Extension believes that everybody should have access to um, research-based, science-based education. And those of us that are Extension educators and, and volunteer coordinators, really our role is to help our communities to um, not only to learn about the information coming out of the university and, um, and our Extension research, but also to get communities involved um, in that information. And that's really where the volunteer program programs come in. There are seven focal areas or seven units across Penn State Extension under the Co College of Agricultural Sciences. And I'm presenting to you today from the um, Agronomy and Natural Resources Unit. So I am going to be talking about um, three different volunteer programs, and I promise they will go quickly. Um, the first one will be our Master Well Owner Network program. I'm only going to touch briefly on this one, um, even though it is a statewide program, but it's a special volunteer opportunity specifically for those within um, our existing volunteers within our Master Watershed Steward Program um, that you'll hear about in the next presentation. Um, but I, I do think it's important to, to touch on that project. Um, I'll then be talking about the greening the Lower Susquehanna project which is a volunteer program open to anybody, but is geographically limited in its opportunities. Um, but that program's nice because you don't have to sign up for anything long-term. Um, these are one-off opportunities. And then finally, I'll end with um, the first investigations of stream health protocol and project, um, which anybody across the state or even outside of Pennsylvania can use. And this is more of a self-driven project. So first with the Master Well Owner Network Project, um, like I said, this is an advanced volunteer opportunity for our Master Watershed Stewards. Um, and the reason that this is limited to existing Master Watershed Stewards is because those watershed stewards have already gone through some extensive um, education and training in water resources. And so we really want those that are helping to teach um, our residents about um, Proper, um, proper maintenance of wells and other private water systems for drinking water, um, we really want those volunteers to already have an established foundational knowledge of watersheds and how groundwater and surface water are connected. Um, so that's why this program is limited. Um, but it is really important that we have volunteers focused on um, helping to provide education to our private water supply users across the state. Uh, we are the only state that has no state water, statewide um, regulation of private water supply construction. Um, and so there's just a lot of information that, that 
private water, and I don't say private water owners specifically, it's private water owners, private water supply owners, but also private water um, supply users. So if you're renting a house that's on a well water, for example, um, people need to understand um, what can impact their their private drinking water systems and what they can do to help um, test to make sure that that their drinking water is is safe to consume. Um, more than a million homes across the state are on these private water supply um, supplies and so it's really important that we have volunteers that are focusing on this. Um, so during this training, um, our volunteers gain content knowledge, so they understand, um, they're learning about what our different um, private water systems are and the proper management of those systems. Um, they're getting guidance on how to educate private water system users and provided with the materials to support those community education efforts. And then finally, they're given an understanding with um, to, um, how to reach private water users. So they're doing this through education booths. So you would see them at farm show, ag progress days, or other local fairs across the state, presentations to watershed associations or township meetings. They'll write articles for local newspapers and organizations. And those are just some of the ways that they are reaching our private water users. Um, the one thing that's important to know is that our master well owner network volunteers do not give specific recommendations on water treatment. They're providing the information on how to get your water tested, um, which may indicate that some treatment um, steps are necessary, but then they will not provide recommendations on water treatment. They will provide you with resources and how to contact your local experts to deal with that treatment side of things. Um, just some information, some, some stats, you can see some reach here um, from the last year, so 2021 to 2022. Um, across the 68 volunteers that were involved in this program, um, they reached almost 2,000 private water supply users in Pennsylvania. And they did this primarily, um, or at least 50% of them, were through one-on-one -on -one consultations with friends and neighbors. Um, they also spent a good deal of time, like I said, at those education booths and presentation to, um, to, to a specific group. Um, and I should have noted um, earlier that um, this project is supported through, through grants through DEP, which is really a, a way that we're able to provide um, this, this education to our communities. Now I'm going to hop on over, so we're getting a little bit um, less narrow so to speak. Um, so this is a project greening the Lower Susquehanna that is open to all volunteers, um, but it is geographically limited. Um, I do want to point out before I get going with this segment of the presentation that I am not affiliated with this project specifically. Uh, one of my colleagues who is also involved in the last portion of this talk um, is is involved in this her name is Kristen and so she provided these slides so I've got her contact information if you have questions about this project specifically because I probably won't be able to answer them unfortunately um, but this this project is a volunteer conservation corps project that was started about 10 years ago and it's a partnership between Penn State Extension and the Penn State um, Agricultural and Agriculture and Environment Center um, and the Penn State Ag and Environment Center is really focused on providing research, um, education, and outreach to landowners within several high priority watersheds. Um, and with the goal that this education and this outreach will lead to increased um, adoption of water quality improvement projects within those areas. So the Greening the Lower Susquehanna um, program provides an opportunity to engage um, and provide education to local residents through volunteer engagement, but also provides a cost-effective way to help with install practices. Um, this program is limited to the um, Dauphin, Lebanon, and Lancaster counties, although occasionally there will be opportunities in York and Cumberland counties within the lower Susquehanna region. So the difference between this program and other programs that um, I'm, I'll be talking about um, is that each event is, um, well, there's no long-term commitment. 
So each event is advertised um, individually, and so volunteers sign up for the programs that work for them. They can sign up for one, um, or they can sign up for several. Um, they can, um, well, because they are signing up for individual and very, you know, date specific projects, each of, um, at the beginning of each project, um, there will be some education happening. So um, the leaders will explain why the project is important, the reasons that we're trying to protect our local water resources, and then, of course, how to complete whatever that day's activity is. So all of the projects implemented through this program um, are tied to improving the health of local streams and other water resources. So there are also projects that volunteer can do using only hand tools. So no, no power tools or no power equipment is needed. Um, so it's really easy for volunteers to get involved. Um, projects they've done include tree plantings, um, pollinator garden plantings, invasive species removal near creeks, live staking, live staking products, litter cleanup. Um, their most common project type, though, is planting and um, more recently maintaining riparian buffer habitats. Um, many of these projects um, have been identified and designed by partner organizations. So um, the organizers of this program work very closely with conservation districts, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, local watershed groups, land and land conservancies, municipalities, and other partners. So some of the projects are um, kind of Penn State projects that were designed and, and coordinated solely by Penn State, um, where the connection was made with the landowner and, and Penn State planned the project. But the really the strength of this program is that um, is being able to provide volunteers and, and volunteer coordination to help partners across the region. So some stats for this project, um, it's been very successful over the last 10 plus years. Um, these are stats um, from the start of the program through the fall of 2022. So there have been 182 events, over 600 volunteers and over 4,500 people have attended different events. So maybe not as volunteers, but um, have gotten involved in other ways. Um, over 18,000 trees have been planted with 12 tons of litter cleaned up and a considerable um, number of acres um, planted um, throughout these, these programs as well. And then finally, um, all of this volunteer time kind of translates into $377,000 worth of a volunteer time devoted to helping um, to, to make improvements and educate others about healthy waterways. Um, the riparian buffer reduction stats that you see there, so um, the, the amount of nitrogen reduction, phosphorus reduction, and sediment reduction from planting those riparian buffers, those are solely from 20 projects, uh, roughly 20 projects that were um, specifically Penn State identified and planned projects. And then one more kind of um, stats slide here. So at the end of each season, a survey goes out to all of the volunteer participants um, to see you know, whether or not they learned anything. And I don't have that shown on this slide, but 100% um, of the participants that um, completed the survey did note that they learned something by participating in these projects. And the stats that you see there show that 63% of the people that completed this survey plan to take action on their own property because what they learned um, and experienced through the volunteer actions on these other properties. So I think that's pretty remarkable that this is translating into um, some of these volunteers' own behavior and own practices on their own properties. 
So as I mentioned, I'm not affiliated with this project, but if you are interested in, in learning more, um, you can reach out to Kristen, whose email address is there on the bottom of your screen. Um, you can sign up for or learn more about the volunteering opportunities, either through um, their Facebook page or through that volunteer green at psu.edu website um, or email address as well. And if you didn't get a chance to write that down, I'll include Kristen's email address um, at the end, or you can send me an email and I will connect you with her. So the last project I'm going to go through is FISH, which is First Investigation of Stream Health. Um, and this is a community science tool. Um, this project is aimed at capturing the positive changes that are occurring um, specifically after a restoration pro project is implemented along a stream. Um, it can be used by community scientists, so that means anybody within the community um, to help monitor local streams and, and investigate what's happening with their local stream. Um, and it's really designed to be used on small streams where you can see that individual small scale restoration projects can have still a big impact on stream health. Um, and what's cool about this project is in the process of collecting some inform information about stream health and, and how your restoration practice is making an improvement on that stream, um, it's really also teaching the user what goes into evaluating a stream, what makes a stream healthy and, and healthy riparian habitat. So it's, it, you're, you're learning as you're participating in this program. So the goals of um, FISH, this FISH project, um, really we want to help people and our communities tell stories about how the work that they're doing along a stream is improving the health of that stream. So we're trying to connect people to streams and projects. We're encouraging maintenance of those, of those projects to continue um, the benefits that you'll see along those streams. Um, and then, like I said, we, we want to hear these stories. So we want to discover what those success stories are um, and share those out so that more people are inclined to implement these practices. So determining whether or not FISH is right for you. Well, FISH is a really simple family-friendly activity, so it's great. It's, it's great for the individual. It's great for families. You can also do it with school groups. It asks really easy questions. Um, it's a visual survey, so you're not collecting stream chemistry. You're not collecting um, the aquatic insects or those macroinvertebrates as indicators of stream quality. So it makes it really easy to teach. It's kind of like a first step in evaluating the health of your stream because it's almost all visual. Um, and then recording the data really helps you and others understand um, how the health of the stream is changing over time. We want this to be an ongoing survey, not just a one-off um, one -off deal. So like I said, simple questions. There's only one question on the protocol that requires any equipment, and it's an optional question. So if you don't have access to that equipment, um, which we are working to have lending, um, lending equipment across the state, but if you don't have access to that, um, don't wanna make it, then we can, um, you can skip that question. Um, the results are really calibrated to you. So um, the questions are asked in a scale from one to nine or many of the questions. And so how I might rate a stream for one parameter might be a little different from how you would rate it, but that's okay because you are going to be the one going out time after time to collect the data. And so you will be able to notice changes. So that's what I mean when I say those results are calibrated to you. You're the one doing that visual assessment and recording those results. So you will be able to see those changes. Um, and then it's really, I should have put this at the beginning because really what this is, is it's a guided interaction with the stream. So we're helping you get into the stream, learn about your stream, but in an easy guided way where you're also going to learn a bit about what's going on with the health of that stream. So the basics of fish are who, what, when, and where. So who, like I said, um, this is for individual landowners and families. So if you've got a stream on your property and you want to do some streamside restoration, it would be great to follow it up with this protocol. Um, homeowners associations that want to know 
about the, the restoration practices they're implementing in their region um, or on their properties, how is that impacting the health of their streams, youth and volunteer organizations, um, as well as um, public and private landowners or land managers. Um, so really what you're doing is you're taking a holistic view. And like I said, this is a visual survey that you're, you're doing of your stream. So you're looking at what's happening in the stream, so on the stream bottom, bottom and in the water, as well as on the banks and shoreline. And as I said, there's no chemistry involved, and there's only one question that involves any sort of equipment. We ask that people collect these data at least once a year, um, but preferably um, you would go out twice, once in the spring and once in the fall. Um, but you can certainly go out more than that. Um, if you wanna go once every season, so four times a year, that would be great. Um, but ideally you're going to do this before you even conduct any stream restoration project. So you're getting that before baseline of the health of the stream. And then you're going to continue to collect these data for several years, um, ideally, um, several years after, because sometimes these changes that we're seeing along in stream health based off of um, or, or the, the results, the improvements from those stream restoration projects are often going to, you know, take some time to see those results. So we want to be collecting data long enough to see that. Um, so collecting data before and after is really going to give you the best um, chance at documenting that, your story of what is, um, how your activities are improving that stream. Um, we want these to be done on weightable streams. We don't want people to be doing these on really fast moving streams where it's going to be a little tenuous and dangerous. And these are along weightable streams. And ideally, like I said, streams that have been recently restored or are even more ideally scheduled for restoration projects. Um, and streams where, of course, you have landowner permission to explore that stream. So maybe it's the, the access to the stream is on your neighbor's property, but the restoration practice is on your property. Well, you want to make sure you've got landowner permission and you don't just start traipsing on somebody else's land. So that's always something that's important that we talk about. So how do you collect the data? Well, there are a couple different ways. You can um, print out the protocol and collect it um, on, on paper, clipboard and paper. Um, that we do advise people do that for the first couple times, one or two times that they go out, because it's just easier to see what the, the, the different questions are um, when you're looking at that printed copy. And then you would enter it onto your computer um, into a, a um, data portal that we've set up. Um, or, you know, once, you, once you've got an idea and you've, you've done the protocol at least once or twice, um, then go ahead and use the mobile app if that is your preference, um, because then those questions will make a little bit more sense. Um, you don't have the nice um, graphics on the mobile device to give you kind of examples of the different um, question scales. So if we're looking at something like embeddedness, which is how much um, sedimentation or, or loose um, soil is covering the bottom of the, um, the stream, we give you some example photos, which you would get on the hard copy version, but you're not really going to get in the mobile app. So that's why we, we ask people to take the paper copies out the first time or two. Hey, Natalie, you have a yeah. two minute warning. Okay, thank you. I'm on my second to last slide. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so you can find out more information um, on our website. Um, this article here, if you just go to Penn State Extension's website, which is extension.psu.edu and search first investigation of stream health, this will be the first article that comes up. There are lots of links to it other information about um, stream health at the bottom of this article, so you can find a little bit more there. Also, if you are really interested in this, we do have a webinar coming up specifically on fish. Um, registration isn't open, but on my last slide, you will have my email address. So you can reach out to me and I will send you the registration link as soon as that opens. But that will be May 23rd um, from 10 to 11.30. If you want the recording of that, but even though you may not be able to attend live, go ahead and still register. Everybody that registers will get access to that recording. Um, and so with that, um, thank you. And maybe I left one minute for questions. 
Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much. So uh, we're actually going to run straight into our next presentation um, and hopefully we'll be able to take questions towards the end. Um, so if you can stick around, then you might have some questions in there. Great. Um, Okay, so with that, um, I'd like to introduce Erin Frederick, the statewide Master Watershed Steward Coordinator with Penn State Extension, and she will be talking about the Master Watershed Steward Program. Thank you, Amber. Uh, I, it's not letting me turn my video on, but uh, I can move forward with sharing my screen. You don't necessarily need to see me. But let's see, I'm imagining everyone can see it now. Yep, looks good. Okay, great. Thank you, Amber. So I've got five minutes to do a quick overview of our Master Watershed Steward Program. And thank you so much, Natalie, for setting the stage, uh, explaining extension, and, and uh, I'll be able to go right into our program. So our program first started in 2013. It was a pilot program in the Lehigh Valley. And uh, our, our goals were to first and foremost, uh, educate and empower volunteers to protect the environment uh, and provide them the tools to, to do that. Uh, we want to create partnerships. We wanna work with conservation districts, watershed associations, libraries, uh, anyone who has a vested interest in protecting the environment. Uh, Cause we believe that all, if we work together, we can accomplish so much more. We also want to educate the community about water and natural resources and advance on the ground restoration projects. Now, 10 years later, we have 860 volunteers across 42 counties in the state. Uh, the counties in blue, light blue are coming online this year. We are offering a training session that starts in March. It'll run through June. And hopefully uh, this will be the year we, we hit a thousand volunteers. Uh, and our, our volunteers have become a real force uh, for, for conservation across the state. Um, since we started, they've contributed over 113,000 volunteer hours, and we've reached over 300,000 residents, which is just phenomenal. I, I think last year alone, uh, our stewards planted over 21,000 trees. So uh, we're educating people. We're uh, really making a difference in the environment. And uh, our, our volunteers come from all walks of life. Uh, we have college students all the way up to retirees. Uh, we, we, we try to recruit people that really just have a passion for the environment and they want to volunteer. There's, there's no experience necessary. Uh, we, we provide the training that they need and the tools that they need to get involved. So uh, our training consists of 40 hours in a variety of environmental science topics, uh, such as invasive plants, flooding, water treatment, uh, right now, we are doing them virtually uh, on a weekday. Uh, it's statewide, so we bring in our extension educators and some partner staff to conduct the training. And then our county programs, uh, our local staff bring in uh, professionals uh, from the area and also do field trips so that the volunteers can get outside, meet each other, and interface with our local, local partners. After training, the volunteers need to secure 50 hours of volunteer service. And then they'll get their badge. Uh, you're officially a master watershed steward. And then to remain in the program each year after that, we require a minimum of 20 hours of volunteer service and 10 hours of continuing education. And these opportunities are all compiled uh, by our county coordinators. There are our paid staff. They're in charge of uh, continuing to engage these volunteers. Uh, they're the ones reaching out to our project partners, finding out what the needs are, compiling it all, and sending it off to the volunteers. So as a volunteer, you can pick and choose what you want to do based on your interests, based on your time, and you don't have to go hunting for anything. And now I just have a few slides on some example volunteer projects uh, that have happened across the state. Um, We've done a lot of educational workshops for a variety of audiences, school groups, homeowners associations. We've worked closely with municipalities to help them with their stormwater education and outreach requirements as part of their MS4 permits. Uh, workshops have included rain barrels, rain gardens. Uh, this past year, we launched an initiative for downspout planters. 
And uh, we also uh, partner with the Nurture Nature Center based in Easton uh, for a statewide uh, watershed friendly property program. And with that, we provide our volunteers with brochures, educational displays uh, to teach people how to make good changes to their, their, their property um, by with rain barrels, rain gardens, and so forth. And then uh, the property owners can then uh, fill out an application uh, to become officially watershed friendly and, and get a sign if they want. And we are continuing to expand this program this year. Uh, we do have a program targeted just for youth uh, in high schools. It's a future master watershed steward program. Uh, in this situation, our master watershed stewards would be working directly with uh, high school students, um, providing them with some education and working with them on a, a service project. We also have uh, numerous educational displays that our volunteers can take out to different community events, uh, interact with the public. Uh, we have volunteers that love creating presentations and going to libraries or Lions Clubs and presenting. Uh, we have some standardized public presentations on riparian buffers, plastic pollution, uh, and a variety of others. And we're also open to, to creativity um, with whatever the volunteer is, is passionate about. Uh, we have volunteers that like to write articles for local papers. We've had volunteers work with county governments and uh, provide text on stormwater uh, education for their websites. We have a lot of volunteers that love to get outside, get their hands dirty, work on riparian buffer restoration projects. We've done a number of live stake nurseries across the state, uh, lakeside plantings, uh, our volunteers have gotten involved in, in maintenance and helping to design educational signage uh, and brochures to support these restoration projects. We've also constructed demonstration rain gardens, uh, municipal buildings, we've done bioswales, uh, naturalized quite a few stormwater basins. Uh, we're converting lawn into meadows. We also do a considerable amount of citizen science projects. We've uh, done a variety of water quality sampling and, and monitoring programs. We have some stewards that are monitoring erosion on stream banks. We have another set of stewards that are piloting an illicit discharge monitoring program to work with our municipalities to see if there's any uh, flows coming out of the stormwater outflows during um, dry weather. Uh, we have some folks that are getting involved in vernal pool monitoring. So we have lots of citizen science opportunities like that. And we also do stream cleanups. And uh, we've our program in York County, they have this uh, great program called Street to Creek, where they work with local artists to paint storm drains. Uh, we have other stewards in, in some of the other counties that do storm drain market, marking. So uh, this is just a, a snapshot of a number of the programs that our stewards can get involved in, but ultimately we we try to have a flexible program that's fun and rewarding, and uh, people can can give back and um, you know, just enjoy themselves. So I think that's probably my five minutes. I will stop sharing. Thank you so much, Erin. That was a really wonderful overview of the Master Watershed Steward Program. And we are going to move right into our next volunteer program. We're gonna hear from Andy Faust, the Master Gardener Area Coordinator with Penn State Extension. So Andy, I will let you take it away. Okay, great. Amber, thank you uh, for having us. It was wonderful to be here. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Andy Faust. I'm currently overseeing the Master Gardener program here with Penn State Extension. Uh, I live here in Center County. And um, before I kind of go through some slides, I want to put a shout out to the Master Gardeners uh, in Erie. We have a wonderful group, um, wonderful group of Master Gardeners in Erie and uh, well over, I think, 100 and maybe 15, 120 Master Gardeners there spent many hours uh, with the group. So a great photo to kind of start the, uh, the presentation here. Um, so a wonderful group. Okay, so what is the mission of uh, Penn State Extension Master Gardeners? Uh, those of you that aren't familiar with our program, um, it's similar to what Aaron was talking about as far as the master watersheds. Um, our program is focused more on horticulture, right? And teaching our volunteers uh, from a horticulture lens and then providing volunteerism to the uh, folks in our communities. So the mission of our program, 
uh, is to support the Penn State Extension by utilizing research-based information and to educate the public on best practices in consumer horticulture and environmental stewardship. We have almost 4,000 master gardeners um, across the state, uh, and we are on every county of Pennsylvania, uh, which is wonderful, all 67 counties. Um, and it's always neat to, to note all the time and volunteer hours that our volunteers put in uh, this past program year. Um, we hit over the 197,000 hour mark uh, for you know, across the state that our volunteers put in time um, educating our communities, you know, from a horticulture lens. So there's a value value to these things, uh, like Aaron was talking about. Um, and so this value is reported at being just under six million dollars. So great work to all the master artists across the state. Uh, our volunteers or our community folks go through a training program uh, called basic training. Um, and it is uh, pretty, pretty um, uh, rigorous training from a horticulture perspective uh, in many topics, including you know, soil, um, herbaceous perennials, um, fertility practices, nutrient management, um, the list goes on and on, right? Now we have pesticide education, um, pesticide awareness um, as well, too. So our pro our program is designed for tr for residents to um, you know engage with the program, take the basic training class, and as they are working through the class, um, they can start to do education in the communities um, where and when appropriate. This is an example of um, you know uh, some of our outreach that we do during. Uh, farm show in Harrisburg, and we have a trainee here that is uh, educating the youth on um, on apples and the importance of apples uh, with our uh, Apple IQ quiz. Across the state, um, some of the programs that we've done um, are rather large, right? We we, you know, we this year we you know we accomplished uh, a lot of things and over thirty six hundred educational programs. Um, that we put out in county and state programs. And uh, we we do a lot of things uh, similar to what Aaron is talking about. We have a lot of master artists that like to write articles and like to put out education, um, focus on spotted lanternfly. Uh, we do youth outreach programs. Um, we do a lot of work with demonstration gardens. And in these demonstration gardens, and there's there's several in Erie, in Erie County, um, but we have demonstration gardens throughout the state. And uh, we do a lot of education in these gardens. So we invite uh, the folks from the community to the gardens and um, maybe focus on uh, a particular topic and have a workshop there. All right, uh, the picture to your left is uh, one of the statewide programs we do, uh, Woody ID, Woody Tree ID, and a um, good program if you're interested in um, learning more about identifying our, our Woody trees out in the landscape. And we also align with pest education um, with our youth programs. I talk about Mr. Yuck and, and poison safety. So a lot of uh, our volunteers that go through the program um, can swiftly get out in facing, you know, face our communities, um, answer questions related to horticulture. We have a lot of questions that come in. Uh, some of the top questions that come in are regarding soil, right? And um, it's wonderful to answer those questions. Many counties have our garden hotlines, uh, so you can call into the extension offices and um, speak with a master gardener or send emails uh, to our master gardener hotlines. Right, so it's one way to communicate, and engage, and um, and have questions answered if any if anyone has. Uh, one of the pro programs and educational programs that we that we have is called Seed to Supper. Uh, it's a free beginner gardening program uh, designed to educate families on growing their own food. Uh, on a budget, uh, which is awesome. Great program. Uh, we've had this for several years now. Uh, we partner with Extension's food, family, and health team uh, when we put these programs on. And uh, it's great to see some families um, start to produce their own food and uh, and to follow that, you know, how to take a uh, veg from the garden and, and produce it, you know, using a recipe um, and take it right to your dinner table, right? So it's a great process to see. Uh, we really align with food banks as well um, as as patrons, and so really this is a community uh, partnership program where we can you know, do outreach and education to local 
local community folks and partner up uh, with a local food bank or a community organization uh, as such. That's a wonderful program that, that we offer. Uh, here's a great photo of, uh, of one of our programs with the youth um, in Erie County. This is at the Piper uh, Burley School Garden. Uh, we partner with the Erie Public uh, School System and have gardens in each one of those schools. And the Master Gardeners um, during the season are at the gardens each week um, teaching the youth the importance of growing plants, growing vegetables. Uh, and it's such a great, fun environment. Um, but we do have a lot of partners across the state, you know, over 600 community partners, um, nonprofit organizations. And we create this, um, this, this power of mass, right, of, of our, all of our education um, to really make change happen and put education out there to the community. We love working with the youth as well. And so we've uh, built some programs, uh, our Growing Gardeners program, where we have resources available um, to our county extension um, master gardener programs, and they can be shared uh, or taught by our master gardeners and, and or our coordinator uh, in the counties. Uh, so we spent a lot of time uh, making PowerPoints and creating videos, uh, resources that can be shared uh, with our youth. We also have many collaborations uh, from a research perspective, and uh, I'm just going to highlight two here. We have aligned with the College of Medicine in Hershey um, for our Growing Healthy Heart program, and that's focused on bringing awareness and education to those that have um, high risk for heart disease. Uh, it's a great program, so there's uh, um, patrons that are going through the program learn how to grow their own vegetables, learn um, how to eat the vegetables and what recipes they can make um, to lower their risk. Okay. Uh, another, another collaboration we do from a research perspective um, is understanding our bee populations across the state. And uh, the Lopez Lab, the University Park um, is a great program and we collaborate. Uh, Master Gardeners can engage and, um, and collect information in their own county. And then this information and data is uh, is uploaded so we can have a, a map of the entire state of our wild bee populations, which is a really fun program. So a lot of fun collaborations that we have uh, for education and through research. All right. Uh, also, if you're not familiar with Extension's uh, Master Gardener program, uh, reach out, right? There's lots of ways to connect with us. We have a statewide newsletter, a monthly newsletter that goes out. Um, you can see the the link here, and um, I can put my information in the chat as well, so you can connect with us. Uh, we have a Facebook group too, and Instagram. So, if you have questions, I would love to to talk with you, and um, you know, always looking for partnerships in our counties. Okay, and just remember that you know master gardeners are everywhere. And it's so fun to to engage with um, with our volunteers. Uh, they have such a skill set and a passion uh, for what we do. And uh, so, um, just remember when you're out in out in the community, if you see a master gardener, um, ask away, ask questions, and engage with them, and uh, see how we can make an impact in your life. Okay. And let's I'll wrap it up. I'll put my information in the chat, Amber, as well, so that anyone can reach out. And thanks for having us. Uh, today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much for being here, Andy. That was wonderful, wonderful yeah. summary of the Master Gardener program. Yeah. And I love seeing all the eerie pictures, of course. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. We have a great bunch up there. We really do. <laughs> That's great. Um, so I think we will save some questions for this entire Penn State Extension section to the end. Um, I'm so happy to introduce Tara Mondock, the Associate Director of Client Relations at Penn State Extension to uh, take us home and to the end of our forum today. So Tara, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Amber. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, looks good. All right. Well, thank you again for having us, Amber. I appreciate the opportunity. So my name is Amber said is uh, Tara Mondock, and I'm the Associate Director of Client Relations with Penn State Extension. And I'm joining you today from Penn State's main campus at University Park. 
Um, in my position, I get to work with and through our team across extension on developing relationships with partners um, and sharing programs and resources that are available through extension in each of our 67 counties. So I get to spend a fair amount of time in, uh, in the counties and seeing many of our volunteers you just heard about at work, and I can't say enough how amazing they all are. Uh, now you've heard from Natalie, Aaron, and Andy on a few of our volunteer programs. I'm going to take just a few minutes, and I promise to keep it brief because uh, I know we're nearing the 5:30 point. Um, just to provide an overview of Extension for those that aren't as familiar with us, so you're aware of what other resources are available through Extension. So we are your land grant university in Pennsylvania, and we enable the work that we do with Extension through our College of Agricultural Sciences. So within Extension, we focus on translating research uh, into real world applications and providing uh, access to teams of experts and educational materials that provide for continued learning. Uh, we're delivering programs online in schools and in person in our communities across the Commonwealth. Now we focus our programs in our areas of excellence, and there are seven program units within Extension that allow for, uh, for that work to take place. Our horticulture unit, which you heard uh, from Andy and um, you heard from Andy on the uh, work that we do with our master gardeners, um, focuses on developing understanding and management of our agronomy and horticultural crops and managing uh, landscapes, which are foundational for uh, managing those ecosystems for food fiber, uh, food and fiber production, landscapes and environmental quality to enhance our human environments. Um, our animal systems unit, emphasizes enhancing and maintaining the health and welfare of our equine, poultry, dairy, and livestock animals. And we have experts in each of those areas um, and their contribution to the food system. And those animal experts impart their knowledge on the health and welfare of animals, their nutrition, breeding, marketing, and uh, business management overall. Uh, we provide in our food safety and quality unit, uh, you know, our food safety and quality education, research and outreach activities for farmers, food producers, food handlers and consumers across the Commonwealth to prevent foodborne illness. illness. Um, and this is an important part of the programming focuses on helping growers and our commercial food companies comply with the Food Safety Modernization Act or what we often hear FSMA. And then of course in 4-H, which is one of our flagship programs, we're empowering young people with the skills to lead for a lifetime. And it's an experience to include mentor, um, you know, a mentor, a hands-on project, meaningful leadership opportunity. Uh, our youth actually get to choose their projects that fit with their interest and their abilities. And we uh, talk a little bit more about that in just a moment. And our food families and health um, is where we focus on promoting health and well-being of our individuals, families, communities across the lifespan through programs that focus on personal, family, and intergenerational relationships, human development, strengthening our families, healthy aging, and sustainable quality of life. And last, but uh, I'm sorry, next to last, our agronomy and natural resources uh, we focus on education of our best management practices for field for uh, field crop production and conservation of soils and other valuable resources. Our educators share the research and latest technology uh, to advance the agricultural production, which often leads to increased yields and emphasizes sustainable practices. And lastly, our energy business and community vitality unit uh, works with public uh, industry, business, government, educational, and non-government organizations really within the community to develop strategic planning. They might work with workforce analysis, supply, and uh, supply chain development, as well as new and renewable energy uh, sources. We work with community planning. Uh, engagement is, is an emphasis of our learning. Um, we have much, uh, most recently we launched an innovation and immersive technology team that's focused on integrating augmented reality with all sorts of youth and adult in the community on, and on farm. We have a presence in all 67 counties, uh, not just in Erie, but in Philadelphia and all the other speakers I heard today. Um, you know, we're engaging learners and volunteers online and in person. And we have a network of nearly 11,000 volunteers that focus on both youth and uh, adult education. And we're applying the learnings in the communities where we live. Um, I encourage you to visit our website. I'll have ask Amber to plug that in. Our website is uh, extension.psu.edu. 
where you can also opt in to receive information about uh, any one of those areas of interest. Um, and so I'll ask again that, that uh, Amber share that uh, in chat as well. Just a little bit about our reach. Uh, you know, we've got 31.2 uh, million uh, website views and uh, through the end of 2021 uh, from almost 10 million users. Uh, so we've got a huge reach. Uh, we've distributed a number of uh, publications and we have over 190,000 email subscribers. As we said, our volunteer base is uh, made up of almost uh, 11,000 volunteers with over 638,000 volunteer hours. Uh, we value that at $18 million through the uh, end of 2021. And just call out the fact that many of our volunteers in 4-H, our flagship program again for, for youth uh, leadership development, uh, they've logged approximately 120 hours per year. So we have some super dedicated volunteers who give uh, so much of their time. And speaking of 4-H, I want to just take a moment and share more details on 4-H. So many of you are involved with youth, so I think it may be helpful for you to think about ways to engage and take advantage of some of the resources that are available uh, with 4-H with in particular. This is our flagship program and extension, and it enables our members to tackle projects that build life skills, explore careers, and help our, our young people find their passion in life and they get to participate in camps and conferences and learning and uh, leadership opportunities at both the regional, state, and national levels. Our 4-H members from across the state come together to learn and lead and make new friends um, you know, it, it, throughout our state and, and regional programs. And these programs, uh, which if you've ever talked to one of our 4-H youth, you would see it comes to life immediately. These, these uh, youth actually have more exposure to career paths, hands-on learning opportunities, leadership forums, and so much more. Uh, kids expand their future professional uh, possibilities and they get to learn leadership on the job and gain exposure to new communities and widen their social network through those new friendships. So I encourage you, if you um, don't know a lot about or want to learn more about our our 4-H our program, I'll again ask that Amber slide that into a chat as well. I also want to leave you with, uh, with a way to contact or if you aren't sure what you need or want from Extension, just want to connect with us. Uh, there is a team, we call it the client relations team that acts as our central point of contact and in coming into Extension. Uh, so I have provided an area map uh, along with our contact information uh, to allow you to identify the contact for your county that would help you get connected with the extension and the resources we bring to the county. And again, I just want to encourage you to take advantage of so many uh, resources available in the way of articles, news, online courses, webinars, and opportunities to take part in our workshops available at our extension.psu.edu website. And again, lastly, just want to encourage you to opt in to receive information for the area of interest to enable information to go right to your mailbox. Um, and I uh, want to thank you again for the opportunity uh, to uh, present to you in, uh, today and share uh, what Extension has to offer. Thank you so much. And again, I'll turn it back to you, Amber. Thank you so much, Tara. What wonderful information that we have received about so many volunteer opportunities and education programs. Um, I am looking for questions in the chat. Um, there's a lot of information, a lot of links in there. Uh, so make sure that you go through and click those if you're interested. They will also be recorded in the notes as comments. And all of our presenters have um, entered most of their emails into the chat as well. So I'll give everyone a couple moments to uh, grab the information that they want. Um, Tim, do you have any final comments or questions? I wanted to thank all of our presenters today for doing an excellent job. You know, in my years with DEP, I've worked with Penn State Extension and many of their counties uh, in the Northwest region. And um, it's always been, uh, you know, one of those types of relationships between agriculture and uh, the, the Extension folks that um, has been very important, not only for sustainability, um, for agricultural best management practices, uh, for profitability, um, so that we can continue to have food on our plates. It's all important work. So um, absent any additional questions, I'll turn it back to you. Rebecca, I see your hand is up. Sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> no problem. 
Okay, and I'm seeing a lot of thank yous come in and not many questions, but um, again, I'll give folks a couple minutes to grab the information from the chat that they might be interested in. And I want to thank you all for your time today. And thank you, Tim, for being a wonderful co-host. And um, Kelly, thank you for your time being my uh, other co-host, my backup. Um, so thank you all. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening.